System administration is the field in IT that's responsible for maintaining reliable computer systems in a multi-user environment. While systems administration responsibilities can overlap with other roles in IT, a person who works only in system administration is called a systems administrator. Systems administrators have a diverse set of roles and responsibilities. They can range from configuring servers, monitoring the network, provisioning or setting up new users and computers, and more. Think of system administrator as a tech generalist. They handle many different things to keep an organization up and running. It's actually very similar to how IT support specialists work. You need to apply your diverse set of tech skills in different situations to help solve problems in an organization. As an IT support specialist, doing systems administration tasks might be part of the job. So we're going to introduce the skills and knowledge you need to manage organizations and systems to keep your skills well-rounded. By the end of this course, you'll learn what services are used in IT infrastructure. You'll also learn about essential user software for your organization and how to manage an entire organization's users and computers using directory services. Finally, you'll learn the skills you need to back up your organization's data and recover it in the case of a disaster. Before we can get into the nitty gritty of what systems administration is, we need to talk about what these systems are. Organizations don't just run on their own. Employees need computers along with access to the internet to reach out to clients. The organization websites needs to be up and running. Files have to be shared back and forth and so much more. Basically, a sysadmin is responsible for their company's IT services. Employees need these IT services so that they can be productive. This includes things like email, file storage, running a website, and more. These services have to be stored somewhere. They don't just appear out of nowhere. Any thoughts on where they're stored? If you answer servers, you're correct. We talked about servers in an earlier course, and you've learned that the term servers can have multiple meanings. In one course, we discussed how servers have web content that they serve to other computers. In another course, we talked about how servers can be software that perform a certain function. In this video, we're going to talk about servers more in depth, because in many cases, sysadmins are responsible for maintaining all of the company's servers. If you're working as an IT support specialist and have systems administration responsibilities, these tasks could be something you'll perform. A server is essentially software or a machine that provides services to other software or machines. For example, a web server stores and serves content to clients through the internet. You can access the web server through a domain name like google.com. We'll dive deeper into web servers in a later course. Right now, let's run down some other examples of servers. An email server provides email services to other machines, and an SSH server provides SSH services to other machines, and so on and so forth. We call them machines that use the services provided by a server clients. Clients request the services from a server, and in turn, the servers respond with these services. A server can provide services to multiple clients at once, and a client can use multiple servers. Any computer can be a server. I can start up a web server on my home computer that would be able to serve my own personal website on the internet for me. But I don't really want to do that because I'd have to leave my computer on all the time in order for my website to be available all the time. Industry standard servers are typically running 24 seven and they don't run on dinky little hardware like my home laptop. They run on a really powerful and reliable hardware. Server hardware can come in lots of different forms. They can be towers that sit upright that look very similar to the desktops we've seen. Those towers can be put in a closet or can sit on a table if you want them to. But what if you needed to have 10 servers? The towers would start taking up way too much space. Instead, you can use rack servers, which lay flat and are usually mounted in a 90-inch wide server rack. If you needed even more space, you could use blade servers that are even slimmer than racks. There are other types of form factors for servers, but these are the most common ones. You can also customize the hardware on your servers depending on the services. For example, on a file server, you'll want more storage resources so that you can store more files. What about connecting to our servers? Working in a small IT organization, you could potentially deal with a handful of servers. You don't want to have a monitor, keyboard, and a mouse for each of these servers, do you? Fortunately, you don't have to, thanks to something we learned in an earlier course. 
we can remotely connect to them with something like SSH. Even so, you should always have a monitor keyboard on hand. Sometimes when you're working, your network might be having issues and SSH won't be an option. Oh, the cloud, the magical, wonderful cloud that you hear about in the news that moves data across the white fluffy wonders in the sky. The magical cloud disperses bits of data across in the world in itty bitty raindrops, right? Uh, no, that's not how the cloud works at all. But you'd be surprised how many people believe that. There's no doubt you've heard the term cloud in the news or from other people. Your photos are stored in the cloud. Your email is stored in the cloud. Cloud computing is the concept that you can access your data, use applications, store files, etc., from anywhere in the world, as long as you have an internet connection. But the cloud isn't a magical thing. It's just a network of servers that store and process our data. You might have heard the word data center before. A data center is a facility that stores hundreds, if not thousands, of servers. Companies with large amounts of data have to keep their information stored in places like data centers. Large companies like Google and Facebook usually own their own data centers because they have billions of users that need access to their data at all times. Smaller companies could do this, but usually rent out parts of a data center for their needs. When you use a cloud service, this data is typically stored in a data center or multiple data centers. Anywhere that's large enough to hold the information of millions, maybe even billions of users. It's easy to see why the cloud has become a popular way of computing in the last few years. Now, instead of holding onto terabytes of storage space on your laptop, you can upload that data to a file storage service like Dropbox, which stores that data in a managed location like a data center. The same goes for your organization. Instead of managing your own servers, you can use internet services that handle everything for you, including security updates, server hardware, routine software updates, and more. But with each of these options come a few drawbacks. The first is cost. When you buy a server, you pay upfront for the hardware. That way, you can set up your services, like a file storage, at potentially very little cost because you're the one managing it. In a small company, it's usually a sysadmin's responsibility to decide what computer policies to use. In larger companies with hundreds of employees or more, this responsibility usually falls under the chief security officer. But in smaller businesses or shops, as the IT lingo goes, the sysadmin has to think carefully about computer security and whether or not to allow access to certain users. There are a few common policy questions that come up in most IT settings that you should know. Should users be allowed to install software? Probably not. You could run the risk of having a user accidentally install malicious software, which we'll learn about in the upcoming course in security. Should users have complex passwords with certain requirements? It's definitely a good rule of thumb to create a complex password that has symbols, random numbers, and letters. A good guideline for a password length is to make sure it has a minimum of eight characters that make it more difficult for someone to crack. Should users be able to view non-work related websites like Facebook? That's a personal call. Some organizations prefer that their employees only use their work computer and network strictly for business. But many allow other users so their employee can promote their business or goods on social media platforms, stay up to date on current events and so on. It will definitely be a policy that you and your organization's leaders can work out together. If you hand out a company phone to an employee, should you set a device password? Absolutely, people lose their mobile devices all the time. If a device is lost or stolen, it should be password protected, at the very least, so that someone else can't easily view company emails. Another responsibility sysadmins have is managing users and hardware. Sysadmins have to be able to create new users and give them access to their company's resources. On the flip side of that, they also have to remove users from an IT infrastructure if users leave the company. It's not just user accounts they have to worry about. Sysadmins are also responsible for user machines. They have to make sure a user is able to log in and that the computer has the necessary software that a user needs to be productive. Sysadmins also have to ensure that the hardware they're provisioning or setting up for users is standardized in some way. We talked in an earlier course about imaging a machine with the same image. This practice is industry standard with dealing with multiple user environments. 
Not only do sysadmins have to standardize settings on a machine, they have to figure out the hardware lifecycle of a machine. They often think of the hardware lifecycle of a machine in a literal way. When was it built? When was it first used? Did the organization buy it brand new or was it used? Who maintained it before? How many users have used it in the current organization? What happens to this machine if someone needs a new one? These are all good questions to ask when thinking about an organization's technology. Sysadmins don't want to keep a 10-year-old computer in their organization. Or maybe they do. Even that's something they might have to make a decision on. There are four main stages of the hardware life cycle. Procurement. This is the stage where hardware is purchased or reused for an employee. Deployment. This is where hardware is set up so that the employee can do their job. Maintenance. This is the stage where software is updated and hardware issues are fixed if and when they occur. Retirement. In this final stage, hardware becomes unusable or no longer needed, and it needs to be properly removed from the fleet. In a small organization, a typical hardware lifecycle might go something like this. First, a new employee is hired by the company. Human resources tells you to provision a computer for them and set up their user account. Next, you allocate a computer you have from your inventory or you order a new one if you need it. When you allocate hardware, you may need to tag the machine with a sticker so that you can keep track of which inventory belongs to the organization. Next, you image the computer with a base image, preferably using a streamlined method that we discussed in our last course, Operating Systems in You. Next, you name the computer with the standardized host name. This helps with managing machines. More on that when we talk about directory services later. In regards to the name itself, we talked about using a format such as username-location, but other hostname standards can be used. Check out the supplemental reading to find out more. After that, you install software the user needs on their machine. Then, the new employee starts and you streamline the setup process for them by providing instructions on how to log into their new machine, get email, etc. Eventually, if a computer sees a hardware issue or failure, you look into it and think through the next steps. If it's getting too old, you'll have to figure out where to recycle it and where to get new hardware. Finally, if a user leaves the company, you'll also have to remove their access from IT resources and wipe the machine so that you can eventually reallocate it to someone else. Imaging. Installing software and configuring settings on a new computer can get a little time consuming. In a small company, you don't do it often enough where it makes much of a difference. But in a larger company, a time-consuming process just won't cut it. You'll have to learn automated ways to provision new machines so that you only spend minutes on this and not hours. Thank you.